In 750 AD in Lanciano, Italy, a monastic priest was saying Mass at the Church of St. Francis. The priest had been having doubts about the true presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. Is Jesus truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the bread and wine like the Catholic Church claims? He just wasn't sure anymore. Just as he said the prayer of consecration, he looked down at the host, the communion elements of bread and wine, and he saw them transforming into flesh and blood right before his eyes. It wasn't just him that saw it either. The whole church witnessed it as well. Hi, this is Justin Hibbert, and you're listening to Why Catholic, my podcast about the what and why of Catholicism. In our regular episodes about specific Catholic doctrine, we've been focusing on the sacrament of the Eucharist, or Holy Communion. In episodes three through five on the topic of sacraments and a sacramental worldview, I mentioned how as a Protestant, I completely misunderstood Catholicism. I saw Catholicism as this stale and stifling form of Christianity. But when I understood the theology behind sacraments, particularly with respect to the Eucharist, I realized that Catholicism isn't the most stale version of Christianity at all. It is the wildest. And this episode about Eucharistic miracles is going to highlight just how wild it can get. Back when I was an evangelical pastor, I can remember having a conversation with my Catholic friend Martin and asking him, Martin, if the bread and wine truly become the body and blood of Jesus during the prayer of consecration, then why do they remain bread and wine? Why don't we find evidence of some sort of physical change? This is a common question that non-Catholics will ask. The answer is that the Eucharist is a mystery. If you recall from episode 3, I mentioned how the word sacrament comes from the Latin word sacramentum, which means a sacred oath, and the Greek word mysterium, which means mystery. When we participate in these sacraments, we are making a sacred oath, and in turn, we are receiving grace in a wonderful mystery. The mysteries that occur during sacraments don't bring with it some physical change. For example, a person's physical appearance remains the same after they are baptized, minus getting wet in the water, of course, or after they participate in the sacrament of reconciliation. It's not like they are physically glowing or have grown taller. It's similar in the sacrament of matrimony. The Bible says that when a husband is united with his wife, the two become one flesh. However, when a couple gets married, it's not like their DNA suddenly changes and becomes the same as each other. The same is true with the Eucharist. We don't see a change in the physical appearance of bread and wine, even though Jesus' presence has descended on it. I might liken it to the Ark of the Covenant, which I've talked about in episodes 4 and 10 and 11. That golden box didn't look any different when God's presence descended upon it, but it was like an outlet. You don't really know if electricity is running through an outlet unless you plug something into it. But what if there was a physical change? What if the bread suddenly transformed physically into flesh and the wine physically became the blood of the Lord Jesus? That's what's known as a Eucharistic miracle. That was experienced in 750 AD in Lanciano, Italy. If you were a skeptic like me, Your first thought might be, yeah, right, how could we possibly know that this wasn't just some sort of urban legend? Good point. What if I told you that you can actually view the transformed host today at the Church of San Francisco in Lacciano, Italy? Right, I know, I know. You you might be also thinking, how do I know it's not some sort of sleight of hand? The priest could have grabbed a piece of flesh from a cadaver and put blood into a vial and poured that into the chalice. What if this whole thing were all made up? After all, that piece of whatever it is is 1,300 years old. How could we ever verify that this was actually some sort of miracle? Well, you wouldn't be the first to ask that question. In 1970, the Archbishop of Lanciano obtained approval from the Vatican to scientifically examine the relic of the Eucharistic miracle that occurred at the Church of St. Francis in Lanciano, Italy, 1,220 years earlier. The Archbishop requested that Dr. Edward Linoli, the director of the hospital in Arezzo and professor of anatomy, histology, chemistry, and clinical microscopy, perform a scientific examination of the bread and wine that allegedly transformed into flesh and blood. Mind you that we're talking about a piece of flesh and five drops of blood that were 1,220 years old. In any normal circumstance, that flesh would be completely rotted and the blood completely dried out. It would be next to impossible to find anything conclusive. 
Here's what Dr. Linoli discovered. First, he noted that the flesh was actually human flesh, and not only flesh from like a finger, Dr. Linoli pinpointed that this flesh came from the left ventricle of the myocardium. He could clearly see arteries and veins as well as a branch of the vagus nerve. Secondly, the blood was truly human blood. And not just that, it it was fresh human blood. It didn't look like a 1,200-year-old sample at all. It, It looked like it had just been taken from someone who was alive. In fact, he found that it was type AB. Dr. Linoli also noted that the blood that appeared in the flesh, because remember it came from heart tissue, was identical to the drops of blood. In other words, the flesh and blood came from the same individual. Third, Dr. Linoli noted that there was no evidence of preservatives that would indicate that this was some sort of contrived hoax. This was, in his own words, a miracle. In the show notes, I have two links to this report. One is Dr. Linoli's report in a medical journal, which you can purchase for about eight euros. But if you don't know Italian, it's going to be a challenge to read it. However, I also link to a YouTube video from Ray Grijalba that shows the report in Italian side by side with an English translation. I've also linked to Ray Grijalba's YouTube channel as he has a number of videos on Eucharistic miracles that he's compiling for a documentary he's making. Dr. Linoli's research interested the World Health Organization and the UN, and in 1973, they conducted a 15-month study with over 500 different tests. Their tests confirmed Dr. Linoli's research and noted that science, aware of its limits, had come to a halt face-to-face with the impossibility of giving a natural explanation. Now, this Eucharistic miracle wasn't just a one-time thing. This has occurred in various places throughout the centuries. In the show notes, I've linked to a wonderful website started by Blessed Carlo Acutis, who was an English-born Italian Catholic and computer geek. At the age of 11, Carlo began a project of documenting Eucharistic miracles throughout the world and throughout history, which he finished just a year before he passed away from leukemia at the age of 15. The website continues to be updated and serves as a catalog for the known occurrences of these Eucharistic miracles. I want to draw our attention to a newer Eucharistic miracle. This one took place on October 21, 2006 at the parish of St. Martin of Tours in Tixla, Mexico during a spiritual retreat. One of the nuns there had a host placed in a pix. A pix is a small container used to reverently transport and distribute communion to someone who is not at mass, usually someone sick or confined to a hospital or a nursing home. As the nun looked at the host in the pix, her eyes teared up, and she showed the priest there the bread effusing some sort of reddish substance. The priest placed the pix aside, And it wasn't until 2009, three years later, that the bishop of that diocese, the Diocese of Chipancingo Chalapa, decided to begin an investigation. The bishop invited Dr. Ricardo Castañón Gómez to take the lead as he had conducted studies on two other alleged Eucharistic miracles. From 2009 to 2012, Dr. Gomez and his team of scientists conducted a number of studies, and in 2013, they presented the results. They found that this was human blood, type AB. Like the miracle in Lanciano, the scientists found that it came from heart tissue. But furthermore, they discovered that the blood was not coming from the outside of the host, but rather was coming from the inside. The bread was actually bleeding from the inside out. It gets even wilder. Scientists found not only the presence of fresh blood some four or more years after the miracle had occurred, they also found the presence of white blood cells. White blood cells are part of the human immune system, so the presence of white blood cells in the heart would mean that the heart was suffering and the body was trying to repair the damage. But what's even more astounding is that white blood cells can only survive four days to a maximum of four months outside the body, depending on the conditions. Now we're talking about a PIX, a little container for reverently carrying the Eucharist, which is not capable of keeping white blood cells alive for four months, let alone four years. Now you might be thinking, hey, if there's fresh blood, then we can run DNA studies on it. The scientists thought of that too. And get this, study after study came back inconclusive. Jesus is truly a mystery and works in mysterious ways. 
Now, if you think the Catholic Church is quick to proclaim anything and everything a miracle, think again. It, it takes exhaustingly extensive precautions when declaring the miraculous. The last thing the church wants to do is claim something to be a miracle that wasn't and be accused of being reckless and even fraudulent. In the cases of Eucharistic miracles, the church will first investigate them with independent scientists. And in many cases, uh, they'll commission scientific studies throughout the centuries as medical technology develops. This was the case with the miracle in Lanciano. The studies completed in the 1970s were not the first, but they are the most recent. To show you just how slow the church is to officially proclaim Eucharistic miracles, Pope Francis here in 2022 has yet to officially proclaim that the phenomena in Tixla was indeed a Eucharistic miracle, even though the bishop sent him a letter in 2013 with scientific conclusions that a miracle is the only explanation. Needless to say, the church errs on the side of caution. Just recently, in July 2022, just about three months ago from the recording of this episode, there appears to have been another Eucharistic miracle at Our Lady of the Rosary Parish in the town of Zapotalenjo, Mexico, near Guadalajara. Father Carlos Spahn, who is the founder and superior of the religious family of the Immaculate Heart and Divine Mercy, was leading a Eucharistic adoration service. And if you're not familiar with Eucharistic adoration, this is an extension of the typical Mass. After Mass, the priest will take a consecrated host and put it in a monstrance, which is an ornate cross with a place in the center for holding the Eucharist and making it visible to the public. Think of the monstrance like a ring and the consecrated host like the diamond. During the Eucharistic adoration service, the congregation will worship, reflect, and meditate on the Blessed Sacrament. In this case, just after the priest put the Blessed Sacrament inside the monstrance, it appeared to start beating like a heart. I've linked to a video of this in the show notes. It's truly astounding. But for now, we just have a video. There hasn't been any conclusive scientific studies. It likely will be a number of years from now before we have scientific insight into what occurred that day at the Eucharistic Adoration. Now, you may have noticed a few themes in these Eucharistic miracles. They focus on the heart, and there's the presence of AB-type blood. But what could all this mean? Jesus surely didn't give us these miracles so that we could simply perform scientific studies on him. I think something worth noting is that these Eucharistic miracles often occur where there is some sort of prevalence of doubt in the real presence. Sometimes it's easy to think of doubt as the ultimate sin, but I don't think we should think that way. Jesus knows the confines of our human minds, and I think he's one that often meets us at our places of doubt. Those questions of doubt happen because we're thinking and considering, whereas it would be far easier to be apathetic or agnostic. Consider Jesus' disciple Thomas, who told his companions that he would not believe Jesus had risen from the dead unless he was able to touch Jesus' wounds. He never actually made that request in Jesus' presence. But Jesus knew. In fact, despite popular folklore, the text doesn't tell us that Thomas actually stuck his finger in Jesus' wounds, in his hands, his feet, and his side. Jesus simply showed up and invited him to do it. He knew what Thomas's hang-ups were, and just the fact that Jesus knew without Thomas telling him was all the evidence Thomas needed to believe. As absolutely breathtaking as it would be to see one of these Eucharistic miracles, we need to be mindful of Jesus' words to Thomas in John 20, 29. Quote, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. End quote. In the case of the miracle in Lanciano, the transformation of bread to flesh and wine to blood was what the priest needed to overcome his doubts. But you know, I, I think that miracles, while helpful for some, are for some never enough evidence. You may be listening to this incredulously. I, I understand that completely. As a Protestant, I would have claimed that this was some sort of satanic magic trick meant to detract Catholics from Jesus. But of course, that conclusion doesn't make any sense. These types of miracles draw millions closer to Jesus. All I can say is that I would invite you to simply investigate it yourself. It is far too wonderful not to. It is possible that Jesus not only did this miracle for someone there at that moment, 
but also for you now to help convince you that he is always and truly present at Mass. The second observation I would make is about the AB blood type. The AB blood group is the rarest, with AB negative being the most rare blood type. What I find so compelling about Jesus' blood appearing as AB is that if it were AB negative, it's a universal plasma donor. Any patient can receive AB negative plasma and platelets. On the inverse, if it were AB positive, it is a universal recipient because AB positive patients can receive red blood cells from all blood types. We can see Jesus in both of these. First, his grace and goodness and mercy are able to redeem any of us. He is able to heal any of us. And secondly, he is able to receive any of us as well. None of us are too strange or too broken or too weird or too sick or too far gone for Jesus. And that brings me to this repeated theme of Jesus' heart. Spend a little time with Catholics and you'll hear this phrase, the sacred heart of Jesus. This comes from a series of visions that Sister Margaret Mary Alacoque, a French nun, had between 1673 and 1675. The sacred heart of Jesus is often depicted with a crown of thorns wrapped around it, as well as an arrow piercing it. Above the heart is a cross, and surrounding the heart are flames. I've linked to some pictures of it in the show notes. In these depictions, we see both the suffering of Jesus, but also this burning passion of love for us. Jesus was pierced for our iniquities and bruised and beaten for our sins, and it is by his wounds that we are healed. So friends, in these Eucharistic miracles, we see visibly and physically what the Catholic Church has been proclaiming as the reality for 2,000 years. Jesus is truly present in the bread and the wine. And when we eat his flesh and drink his blood, we proclaim his death until he comes again. And when we eat his flesh and drink his blood, we also enter into eternal life with him here and now. He is truly present in the Eucharist, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Friends, a sincere thanks for joining me for our 15th episode. Remember, the, the vast majority of these episodes are 17 minutes or less in length. If you haven't done so, I would recommend you start from the beginning and work your way through as I have an intentional progression for this podcast. Let me just express my gratitude that you've chosen to spend a few minutes of your day with me. I'm so grateful to be able to do this podcast and so grateful to you for joining me. If you haven't done so already, please hit the subscribe button on your preferred podcast provider, join the Why Catholic community, and get the next episode in your email inbox. Just go to whycatholic.substack.com slash subscribe. Again, thanks for joining me on this journey. My name is Justin Hibbert, and this is Why Catholic.